Tonight is social obligations. Assalamu alaikum. And it's actually the request was to be social obligations and reflecting on Surah Al Hujarat. So we're going to reflect on some of the social obligations upon us as Muslims from this amazing surah. In the beginning of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us with something that perhaps many of us look at the literal meaning of and don't understand that there's actually another meaning in it as well. And that is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, لا تقدموا بين يدي الله ورسوله. Do not put yourselves before Allah and His Messenger, but fear Allah. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, don't put anything in front of Allah and His Messenger, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, he said, do not say by anything other than the Quran and the Sunnah. Do not say by anything other than the Quran and the Sunnah. And if a Muslim takes this as who he is as a Muslim, to not think outside of the Quran and Sunnah, and not to act outside of the Quran and Sunnah, and not to say anything outside of the Quran and the Sunnah, imagine the social effect it's going to have on the society. It's going to have on us as individuals, first of all, and then it's going to have on those around us, from our family, and on the whole society. Because obviously there's nothing in the Quran and Sunnah except for that was good and beneficial for us and for the societies that we live in. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us in verse number 6 when he calls us in the name of Iman. And I want someone to tell me at the end of the lecture, inshallah ta'ala, how many times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called us in the name of Iman in this surah. Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu. Think about it, inshallah ta'ala. Those who memorized it or have the mushaf with you, you can look through it, inshallah ta'ala. And those of you who have your phone with you, I'm assuming that you're looking at the Quran, inshallah ta'ala. You're looking at uh, Surah Al-Hujurat in your phone and not on your WhatsApp, inshallah ta'ala. Huh? Bismillah. <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that's one of the lessons we're going to take tonight, inshallah, from that, inshallah. Uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls us in the name of Iman, Ya ayyuladhina amanu in ja'akum fasiqum bi naba'in fatabayyanu an tusibu qawman bi jahalatin fatusbihu ala ma fa'altum nadimin. O oh, you have believed, if there comes to you a disobedient one, a fasiq, with information, investigate. The first thing you have to do is investigate. If someone comes to you and says something about your brother, what should you do? Believe it right away, put it on Facebook, send it out to your broadcast li and a list on WhatsApp. This is what happens nowadays. As soon as we hear something, we put it out. We don't know if it's true or not. They say that so-and-so fell in this. And sometimes it might be from the scholars, from the ulama. They say that this scholar said this or this scholar did this. And we spread it out on social media without even making sure. SubhanAllah. So if someone comes to you who is known to not be trustworthy, you can't accept what he's saying. You have to investigate. But even if it's someone who might, you might think is trustworthy, if the person who is being talked about is trustworthy and well-known, here also you have to investigate. You can't come with someone who's well-known and someone who's trustworthy and then automatically believe the story that's been said about them. You have to investigate. You have to make sure. And as they always say, how many sides are there to the story? Huh? Two sides. There's always two sides to any story. And sometimes right away when you hear the other side, you say, ah, now I understand. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to forbid us. It's going to come later in the ayat about the dhan about having negative suspicions about our brothers and sisters. But if we were always to make this, these, these ayat in this surah is coming to give us qawaid and principles of our obligations towards the societies that we live in, as our obligation towards our brothers and sisters, even towards non-Muslims in many cases as well. How do we deal with, especially in a society like Malaysia, a multicultural society with many different religions and, 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 uh, and, and races, we need to make sure that we focus on understanding these principles and put them into action. We don't just believe anything that we hear. We have to make sure, especially in the times we live in, when news comes on the social media and it comes on the internet, and many of it is lies and fabrications. You have to make sure, always, if any news comes to you, if it comes to you on the internet, take this ayah, it's fasiq, it's obedient, it's, it, it's, it's something that is from a straight source. Never believe it. If it comes from the news agencies, do you believe it? CNN, Fox News, BBC. Always you have to make sure what you're being, what you're being told. 
And always remember that there's two sides to the story. Look at the end of the ayah when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned to us the outcomes. What can the possible outcomes be if we don't confirm, if we don't investigate? Allah said, first of all, He said, that you will come and you will falsely blame someone. You will harm someone out of ignorance. How much harm has been done to someone because of something, a news someone believed, some, that they heard about them, they spread it, and then he comes back and says, I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't know. But, but what happened then? I already spread it, it can't be fixed. The reputation of my brother has been tarnished. People even know, I, make, I might go out publicly and say, I made a mistake. I said this about my brother, but I was wrong. But it's already spread the news about him. So people have it in their hearts against him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, beware, be careful. That you could harm people out of ignorance. And then he said, And then you will come and you will be regretful for that which you have done. But at that time, being regretful, maybe you can make tawbah and Allah will accept. Maybe you can apologize to that individual and they will accept. But the harm that's been done sometimes cannot be reversed. So we have to pay attention to this principle. In verse number seven, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we're not going, as I said, we're not doing tafsir of the surah here. And we're not doing every, every part of the ayah, as you understand. We're just taking some parts of some ayah and some of the ayah, not all of them, inshallah ta'ala. Just to focus on some of these obligations and some of the benefits that we gain from the surah, inshallah ta'ala. In verse number seven, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions characteristics of the believer. And if we're going to be positive members in our society and fulfill our social obligations, we have to have these sifat or these characteristics in ourselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he mentions, iman wa fi qulubikum. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has endeared your faith, your iman to you. And he's made it pleasing in your hearts. And pay attention to the verse when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Habbaba ilaykum iman. Allah makes you love the iman. Allah makes you love the iman. As believers, we have love for certain things. From anything that's from Islam, we love it, no doubt about it. There's, there has to be love inside the heart. But when Allah says, Zayyina, that He beautifies it for you in your heart. And what is the difference here? The scholars said, because if something is beautified to you in your heart, it's going to make you more consistent in doing it. But if you just love something, you might do it a few times, but then you might leave it. But if something is dear to you, and something is beautiful to you in your heart, and you really feel it, then you're going to find yourself being consistent in doing it. So what happens when we have this love and this beauty of Iman in our heart? First of all, we feel it inside. And Allah makes us love it, and, we, and, and our Islam, our Iman, becomes more dear to us and important than anything else in life. And this is the true objective of the Muslim. We want our Iman to be more beloved to us than anything else. You taste the Iman. It has a taste to it that you feel inside. The Prophet wasallam described as the halawa of Iman. The sweetness of faith. You taste that sweetness, you feel it. When you, when you feel it in your heart and you feel you're, 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 you're growing closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then it beautifies your action. And it makes you dislike and hate everything which contradicts it. Everything which goes against it. It becomes something displeasing to you. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what did he say at the end of the verse? And that Allah makes dislike to you or hateful to, to you. The disbelief and the defiance and the disobedience. A true believer... What happens when we see something that is sinful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How should it affect us? What should we do when we see something as munkar? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us in the hadith. What's the first thing that we should do? Stop it with your hands. Second thing, with your tongue. And the third thing, in your heart. But the reality of us today is sometimes none of the three happen. Not even the heart. We were driving down the expressway now and we saw the big Heineken factory. Did it have, many of us might have drove back, no big deal. We see it all the time, it's not a big deal. 
But seeing something like this in a Muslim country should make us upset every time we see it. Because this is from the isyan, from the fusuq and the isyan that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it hatred to the, the believer. We walk past something where people are sinning. Even if we can't change it with our hands, or if we don't have the ability to say something about it, at least in our hearts we need to hate these things as believers. And this is what the effect that Iman has upon us. Anything which is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we can change it with our hands, we have authority, we have to do so. In our households, we have to do so. If we have the ability with our tongues, sometimes it doesn't have to be a big thing. I remember I was in a Muslim country recently, and I was walking in the park after Salat al-Fajr. It was very hot in that country. And one of our sisters, she had her hijab on, she had her abai on, but she was raising it up to walk like this. She had it in her hand, she was walking. So her legs were out and stuff like this. So many people didn't say anything to her. Some people might have hated it in their heart. I thought about the hadith. So I said, I'll remind her. I told her, Ukhti, wear your hijab properly. Didn't look at her, just walked by. She could have cursed at me, she could have said so I had my headphones on anyway, so I didn't hear what she said anything back to me. And I just walked by. But I did my job by advising my sister, just to lower her ibayah, because it's not proper for her to, to wear like that, as a reminder to her. She can accept it, not accept it, that's on her. But it's on me as a, as, 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 as a Muslim man. If I can say something with my tongue, I can say it. Alhamdulillah, I didn't cross any line, I didn't break any laws, I just reminded her to lower her ibayah how it should be done. And this is what happens to the iman of the believer. And what is the result of this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said at the end of the verse, أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ rashidun That these are the rashidun. These are the rightfully guided ones. If we want to be from the rashidun, the ones who are upon guidance, then we need to strive to have these characteristics in our heart. To increase the love of our deen in our heart and to increase the hatred of all of that which goes against La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah in our hearts. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Fadlam min Allahi wa ni'mah. That this is the grace from Allah in His favor. This fadl, this grace from Allah, and this ni'mah, this blessing, this favor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The greatest blessing that we have, my dear brothers and sisters, what is it? The faith, your iman, is the greatest blessing. And then after that, the issue of safety, security, you know, having your, your household, having your daily. Uh, means your, your, your bread and what have you. This is what is the most important thing in life. So when you have this blessing, you have to be thankful for it. Allah also said, Fadla min Allahi wa ni'ma. And the ni'ma, this favor, or this blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's two types. There's a general type which can be from the affairs of the dunya, and this can be for the Muslim and for the non-Muslim. And then you have an issue of the hereafter. And this is only for who? For the believers, only for those who are the true believers, they're the ones who will benefit from this blessing and this ni'mah in the hereafter. May Allah make us all from them, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And subhanAllah, even when it comes to the blessing of the dunya, in reality, as we're learning more, and it's, fun, it's like, it doesn't matter how old we get, we're constantly learning, aren't we? Especially in the days we live in. And we're realizing a lot of the things that we've been taught, a lot of the things that we thought actually or not what they've been made up to be. Actually are not beneficial for us. SubhanAllah. The true blessing in this dunya, is it the money? Even, even now Muslims have, have come to this realization now. That money that we work night and day for and we think this is the, the way and we think this is going to bring us happiness, it drives a lot of people crazy. It makes some people commit suicide. Huh? And the brother who was here, mashallah, visiting tonight, he lived in Ireland. And we were there together for some time. And I remember I sat with some people in Ireland who worked in a, uh, uh, a volunteer organization to help those who were like wanted to commit suicide. And they told me that a local bridge that we have in our community, that uh, they have to patrol it, especially on the weekends, because of the high suicide rate from this bridge. And I was like, dude, it's like 10 meters high. I said, how do they die, you know? I was like, go to one of these big cliffs that we have or something, 100 meters, 200 meters, bismillah. There's no coming back from that. But 10 meters, I'm like, hey, this is, Eddie, how do you die? They said, no, this current's very strong. They're probably drunk and stuff like that. So they end up dying, actually, on this, this 10 meter bridge, you know? You think it would just be like a little dive and you swim to the side after you change your mind. 100 meters, 200 meters, there's no, no, no turning back then, huh? SubhanAllah. May Allah, may Allah protect us. But for me, it was, it was something very strange. 
Because in our community, with all the problems that we have, we didn't have an issue where people want to commit suicide. But it was something very high for them. And they said one of the reasons that made them fall into that, they said the depression, because before 2009 and the financial crisis or the financial crash, which hit Ireland very hard, just like it hit Dubai very hard, but Ireland didn't have Abu Dhabi to bail them out, uh, like Dubai, so uh, they stayed uh, you know, in, a, in a poor situation and a lot of problems in Ireland. And many people after they were so wealthy and so successful, they couldn't handle it, and people started to take their own lives. So the real blessing of this life, what is it? It's in finding peace of heart and peace of mind. This is the true ni'mah, the true blessing. This is what everybody wants to find, true happiness. And you're only going to find this through your obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And why do we focus on these ayat? Because when we find this peace of heart, and we find this tranquility within, it's going to have even an impact on how we are in the society, how we deal with others in the society, and even these implementations of these lessons that Allah gives us in the surah, the only way we can truly do it is through true iman. And once we've achieved this peace of heart, once we've achieved this sakina, this tranquility of iman in our heart, and we've tasted the halawa, the sweetness of faith, once we find this, then we're going to want to share it with others. We're going to be peaceful when we deal with others. We're going to be fair. And we're going to be able to implement all of these things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in this surah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to reconcile between our brothers if they were to fall into fighting. It's human error. Uh, it's human nature, excuse me. It's human nature that we're going to differ. There's no way that we're not going to differ. We're going to get angry at one another. Even husband and wife who have a very strong relationship. Is there ever any marriage without any disputes or any fights? It happens in every marriage. Is there any working relationship where you're not going to get any cross from your, uh, your colleague and get upset with him or he's going to get upset with you? It happens. It's natural. And the best of the believers are the ones who are able to deal with these and to move on, to overlook, to forgive and to forget. However, if something does happen, and it comes to a bigger nature where they start to fight, whether it be physically, whether it be feuding, whether it be on the internet behind the screens as people do now, huh? shooting out against one another, uh, missiles of uh, refuting one another or exposing one another and all of this, and it becomes a big fight online. How do we do? We take from this verse, when ta'ifatani min al-mu'minina iqtatalu fa'aslihu baynahuma. Here, they have said, Allah said, if the two parties among the group of the believers fall into fighting, then make peace between them. If we want good for our societies, whenever there's a problem, we have to try to solve it. We have to try to reconcile, to bring peace between our brothers. We have to try to bring peace between our brothers. And what happens, Allah says, فَإِن بَغَتْ إِحْدَاهُمَا عَلَى الْأُخْرَى If one of them is to rebel or to transgress, what do we do in this case? Then you stand up against those who rebelled until they return to the command of Allah, until they comply with the command of Allah. And here, obviously, a lot of times we might listen to this ayah, we might look at it as a big thing when people are actually you know, fighting with swords or things like that. But we can even benefit from it on a lower level as well. And what does it mean? What do we need to do? We stand against injustice. Allah is teaching us in this ayah to stand against injustice. And how do you stand against injustice? You stand with justice, with adl. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَإِن فَاءَتْ فَأَصْلِحُ بَيْنَهُمَا بِالْعَدْلِ وَالْأَقْسِطُ And if they will comply, then you reconcile between them justly uh, and act justly. This is the way of the believer. And this is one of the key objectives of the Muslim is to establish justice upon earth. And we were, when we were an ummah who was concerned about spreading the word of La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, and its teachings, and establishing justice upon earth. Look at our history, Yaqwan. The history that they don't want us to learn. The history we want to forget, I act like it doesn't exist. Look how much we accomplished as an ummah. Because our objective in life was to spread justice and equality and to establish the Quran and the Sunnah upon earth. And subhanAllah, I just came to you guys now from Istanbul, in Turkey. And we see an example of that. When the Ottoman Empire was established in its beginnings, and then even throughout, there was a lot of good, obviously, as well. But when this was established, look at the justice that was established. Look at the difficulties that the people were facing and how Islam came and freed them. 
from the unjust treatment they were receiving from their rulers. And this is the reality of Islam. And this is what we need to revive within ourselves and with our communities and with our ummah, inshallah ta'ala. In verse 10, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches a key principle. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً That indeed the believers are only brothers. Only brothers is who we are. The highest level of brotherhood. Even as the Sahaba saw the akhuwa, the brotherhood of Islam, that it was stronger than the brotherhood of blood. And we see many examples in the seerah of their stances against their own family and standing with, because their own family, when they were about injustice and about kufr and disbelief and mischief upon earth, they stood against their own family and they stood with their brothers in Islam. So the, brother, the, the, the tie of brotherhood in Islam is actually stronger than that of blood. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he described the brotherhood as bunyan. It's been like a building, a structure. He said, you should do ba'dahu ba'da. That it, they, they, the structure pulls itself together, it holds itself together. And he put between his fingers like this, Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. To give the example of what, of how, the, how strong the structure needs to be. And that's why in the ayah, what does Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala command us? فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَ أَخْوَيْكُمْ So, settle to make the settlement between your brothers, to solve the disputes, to solve the problems, like we mentioned in the verse before. Solve all the problems, all of the difficulties. And subhanAllah, uh, <clears throat> when we focus on this, the outcome for us as individuals, for our families, for our communities, always trying to solve the problems. And when should we try to solve them, Ya brothers and sisters? When should we try to solve the problems? As soon as they happen. Pay attention. As soon as we see a problem, we see it started and in, in, in in, in our brothers didn't solve the problem themselves, then we need to step in and fix the problem. Because what happens sometimes, it becomes too big, they drift too far away, and then bringing it back together, as it becomes too late, it becomes difficult. But if we, if we were to step in right away and solve it, me and my brother now are different. Uh, come, I grab him, I grab him, I sit together, we talk to him. Or I talk to him by himself, I talk to him, and I bring them together right away. Because it's the longer we wait, what happens? Who comes? Shaitan comes more and more and more. And then it becomes, khalas, in our heart, the hatred that comes and the animosity that we have between our, towards our brothers, we can't fix it later. Therefore, we need to solve these problems, as I say, nip it in the bud, as soon as it happens, inshallah ta'ala. And we saw this here in now, two of the verses about fixing these problems and reconciling between our brothers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed us in the end of the verse, the way to mercy. Are we in the need of the mercy of Allah? All of us need Allah's mercy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ Then fear Allah, that you may receive His mercy. And how do we fear Allah? By following His command, and staying away from that which He told us to stay away from. Following the command of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and staying away from that which He told us to stay away from. And fearing Allah and how we deal with others. This is one of the principles of this sword that we're studying here tonight. Fear Allah and, and your treatment of others. Fear Allah and how you look at others. Fear Allah and how you talk about others. All of these lessons. And so that's why these ayat that are coming, some of the key principles or some of the key social obligations that we think about in Surah Al-Hujurat, all of these ayat we're mentioning now are like muqaddimat for some of them. It's that you're building the foundation of Iman first. Because if that foundation is not built, the foundation of taqwa and Iman, and understanding who you're dealing with. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً This is your brother you're dealing with. This is your brother. You need to know how to treat your brother. And then you're going to see after these ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts to say some of the rulings, some of the social problems that we face when we tend to fall into them in order to stay away from them. But if we build this, the foundation of loving Allah, loving His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, loving our faith, having our faith be more dear to us than anything, having hatred to anything which is kufr, which is disbelief or fusuq or isyan, any type of disobedience to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, that we have this hatred towards it in our hearts, then when we come and we want to implement these, these different rulings we want to talk about now, it's going to be easy inshallah ta'ala. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, in verse number 11 mentions three or four issues for us. The first is, once again after being called in the name of Iman, Ya ayyuhaladina aminu. And there's a qaida or a principle when it comes to all of the verses in the Quran 
and there's 89 of them that have ya they have ya ayyuhal ladina amanu in front of them a nasiha a piece of advice from one of the greatest sahaba when it comes to the understanding of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu an he said if you hear ya ayyuhal ladina amanu he said listen closely to it listen closely because it's either good you're going to be called to do or evil you're going to be told to stay away from so these ayat have a special status Allah is calling us we say we're believers we say we believe we say la ilaha illallah muhammad rasulullah we do what we're supposed to be doing as muslims then we have to pay close attention to these ayat Allah calls us in the name of iman ya ayyuhal ladina amanu la yasghar qawmun min qawm let not people ridicule or make fun of other people How many problems happen in society because of this? Where people look down upon people, people ridicule other people. And then look what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. What is one of the reasons why we shouldn't do this? Obviously there's many problems that come from ridiculing. But something that we didn't think about is that Asa and Yakunu Khairam Minkum. That perhaps they're actually better than you. Perhaps they are closer to Allah than you. Perhaps they're doing something. They have they have a, a special relationship between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you don't know about. Perhaps they have some deeds that they're doing that you don't know about. And you look at them miskeen, making fun of them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves them. And when you go against someone that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves, beware. Beware of harming yourself. Never look down upon anyone. Even the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam taught us if we saw someone who's less fortunate than us, how do we look at them? If we see someone who's handicapped, what is the du'a that we make? We thank Allah subhanahu wa taala for not afflicting us. This is the way of the believer. We never make sukhriya. We never make fun of anyone. We never make fun of anyone as Muslims. Say alhamdulillah, Allah has blessed us. And if they haven't blessed them, someone you look at them, they look miskin the way they look. They're not very handsome, huh? And you're very handsome. Who made you handsome? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who tested him not being handsome Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said alhamdulillah instead of making fun of him because you could have been like him you can go out now in this rain get in a car accident and you become uglier than him because you made fun of him be careful don't make fun of anyone and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said and this is the second point in the ayah wala nisa'un min nisa and not and not let don't let women ridicule other women why is this because wouldn't it be sufficient that if when Allah says the qawm, the people, or the group, doesn't that include men and women? It includes both. So why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention qawm, which includes both male and female, and then come right after that and mention the women? What is it, Yaqwan? What's the reason? There's, there's, there has to be hikmah. Because then Allah would just say the qawm, and it would have been enough. Because it means... Yeah, you're the Amanu. Who is it? Who does it include? Just men, huh? Just for us? Men and women. Oh, the Quran is all like this. It includes men and women. But here, as the scholars of Tafsir mentioned, when something like this comes, it's to put extra emphasis, to spread more light on this issue. And this issue here for the women, what is it? The sisters know, but they don't want to say. So. They're more inclined to uh, gossip. That's it, alhamdulillah. Be, 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 they're more inclined to gossip, the brother said. And this is true. Women, in general, that's their nature. They like to talk. You'll find, for example, if someone doesn't fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, she'll go and say, oh my God, did you see so-and-so tonight? Did you see her nails? Did you see how her hair was? Her makeup? How could she wear that color, you know? And then, no brother would think anything. And even if we didn't have iman, we would not think the brother, what shirt he had, color he had on, how his hair looked. It wouldn't even cross our mind, you know. Our thing is to go home now, relax a bit, and go to sleep. And hopefully benefit a bit from the lecture. And go home. What, how someone looked is, is, is not our concern. Did you see the brothers? Did you see his trousers? Did you, yeah, it's, it's, not our, it's not our thing, you know. We don't, so this is the nature of women have this. Something of nature. So, so Allah is warning, beware. And especially you who have that in your nature. Beware not to fall into that trap as well. And make fun of other women. Why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said, Asa ayakunna khayran minhum. That perhaps they are better than them as well. 
So never look down upon anyone else. Do not insult others or call them in offensive names. Don't insult yourselves as if you, as you come and you look down upon other people and you come and you insult other people. The Prophet وسلم, in the hadith, he mentioned the muflis. Who is the muflis? The one, and he, literally what does muflis mean in the Arabic language? The one who's bankrupt, or the one who's broken, who has no money. Huh? What did he say? He said, no, the one who is truly bankrupt is the one who comes and he's, and he's cursed this one and said this about that one and he's taken money haram from this one. So what's going to happen Yom al Qiyamah? He's going to take from his hasanat. What happens if his hasanat finishes? He's going to take his sayyat, his bad deeds, and put it upon him. SubhanAllah. This is the one who is truly the bankrupt one. The one who truly has no khair and no good. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us all, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And then in verse 12, three of the destroyers, Allah warns us about them. Three things which destroy friendship, it destroys brotherhood, it separates families, it ends marriages, it harms communities, society, and the ummah if we fall into these things. What are the three things? Suspicion, the dhan, the negative suspicions, and spying upon one another, and backbiting, the ghiba. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala once again calls us in the name what? Of Iman. Ya ayyuhu alladhina amanu, ijtanibu kathira min al-dhanni, inna ba'da al-dhanni ithim. O you have believed, avoid much of negative suspicions. Indeed, some suspicions is sin. Falling into suspicion. As believers, what are we ordered to do about our brother? And we, many times, me and the brother, we've been talking over the last couple of days, as he's been taking me around, things come up, we say, perhaps there's a reason why. He mentioned one of the sheikhs today, and he said that some people don't like him, or some people accuse him of this or that. I said, well, maybe, maybe, there was a, maybe he has a, a good reason. Maybe he, maybe he made a mistake. Maybe what he fell into actually wasn't, maybe it was just, a, it was just a, a genuine mistake that he made. And he didn't mean to do it. Because right away, I can take in my heart something about that sheikh. And I said, maybe he has an excuse that we don't know about. We didn't hear his side of the story. Go back to, again to the, the beginning. I remember there was a famous da'i that many negative things spread about him. And to be honest with you, I'm, I was never really a fan of his, even though he was very, very famous. I was never really, I, his style, his style, everybody's different. The point is, is when negative things spread about him, I say, I said, we don't know the other side of the story. There could be a lot of things. There could be a lot of excuses. Yeah, he made some mistakes, I agree. But I believe a lot of it was blown out of proportion. And I believe if we were to look in his side of the story, we would have also seen something else as well. So we need to stay away from having fun. Why was so-and-so late? Huh? You, know, you know how his so-and-so is, you know they are. Maybe, maybe something, maybe he had a flat tire. Maybe something happened to, to, to his family. You don't know. He always have good dhan. But here it's talking about a dhan with who? What's meant in this ayah, the main lesson or the main moral as we're being taught is, especially when it comes to those who are known to be good. Pay attention to that. Those who are known to be good people, to be trustworthy people, if something which is apparently bad happens or negative happens from them, then here we have to implement this. But if someone is known, for example, to be a fasiq, he's an open fasiq, an open, someone who's disobedient and rebels against the rulings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Huh? If we see him walking out of a nightclub, what do we think he was doing there? He, he wasn't giving da'wah, we know that, huh? <laughs> okay. So, so here is, here the, okay. no, obviously this is clear, what, we know what he's up to. Huh? If we see him with a Heineken in his hand, we know most likely it's not the zero, zero percent. Huh? But if I were to see one of my brothers, who I know he's practicing, I see a Heineken. I don't know if you guys have the zero, zero percent. Huh? They, they started to what, sell in Ireland now for some reason, which I don't know why. Huh? Zero, zero percent. But I understood what it was after some time. I didn't understand. But actually the objective is, is to get the kids to drink it and to get used to it. So as soon as they be become 18, they become... Customers, pure alcoholics, where they go and they drink all the time, they're used to the taste, right? SubhanAllah. But if we were to see something like that, we would assume that maybe it's 0, 0.0. Maybe he took it from someone else and he's going to go throw it away. Always put the, the, the uh, leave away the suspicion when it comes to someone who is what? 
He was known to be trustworthy. And don't let shaitan come to you. Stay away from the dhan. And also stay away from the tajassus. Wala tajassusu. Do not spy upon your brothers. What does it mean to spy upon them? How do we spy upon them? Do we want to know? We heard some things about them. We want to know. So we heard some negative things about our brother, even though he's known to be pious, he's known to be good. And he's like, man, the, the, the biryani is kind of, you know, it's, 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 it didn't go down well. I have to go to the toilet. And you see that on his phone, he doesn't have the auto lock, and his phone's open. Watch. We'll see if it's true or not. You know, does he really have some issues? And we want to get into his phone and see stuff for luck. This is haram, ya khwan, to spy on him. Or we hear him, we want to go around, look, look around the corner, see what he's up to. Like, we don't want to know this. Even many of the, the scholars said, don't tell me about anyone. I don't, I don't want to know these things. SubhanAllah, I told the brothers one of the most negative things about being the imam in a, in a masjid is you know all the negative things about people. And it's something you don't want to know. And many brothers and sisters who, mashallah, they look to be fantastic. And they're part of the community and in the front lines working for the community. Well, you know what goes on behind closed doors? You say, Ya Latif. And you say, I, I didn't want to know that about my brother and sister. So don't look into those things. Don't spy on them. Don't try to gather information about your brothers and sisters. And if you follow the awrat, the ayub, or the mistakes of others, what's going to happen? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to expose one day or another, expose your ayub. And I'll give you an example. We have a certain group, even though they're very small in number, who follow the mistakes of scholars. And do scholars make mistakes? Yes, yes they do. Why? Because they're human. And all of us make mistakes. And a scholar is different, by the way, Akhwan. Limada, why? Because he might have done what he's done on ishtihad. Maybe he sees something that you don't see. Maybe he's reached an opinion on this ishtihad and you think it's wrong, and you don't have the same tools that he has. Especially if you're not a student of knowledge yourself. So, oh, this scholar, that scholar. And you don't know. So these individuals, they follow the mistakes of scholars. How many of them have been exposed? for the immoral acts that they, they do. So Allah exposes them. One by one they get exposed. One by one they get exposed. Falling into different types of haram acts. One of them I remember, he stood with one of our brothers who I know personally, who stands for hours and hours at night in the night prayer. I know, he doesn't tell this to people, but I know I'm in a very close personal relationship with him. He, he was with us in Medina. And even when it comes to the Tarawih in the, in the, in the Masjid Nabu, he doesn't pray there. Because he said, they only pray one juzu, you know. And he, he told me, he said, I, I like to pray three so I can finish you know, several times in Ramadan, the Quran. You know? So I, I prefer to pray the Qiyab at home by myself. It's from the beginning of Ramadan. So I, I know this individual, he's a very pious. I know, I know a lot about his, his personal life. This individual stood up against him, started to talk negative things about him and spread lies about him and even went to the administration of the university and spread lies about him. So much so that he got arrested. For seven months he was in prison. He said it was a beautiful time for me with the Quran, with the Qiyam, alhamdulillah. And they found he was innocent and everything, they let him out, alhamdulillah, he finished his studies, no problem. What happened to the individual who stood against him? He got caught twice for not being honest with money, falling into haram things and money, and Allah disgraced him. Now he has no future, he has nothing he can do. Because he went, he used to try to expose his brothers for what he thought were false. Because he had a different ideology. He looked at topics different from that. That was all, all it was. They had some differences of opinion the way they looked at things. So he wanted to expose him. And he wanted to you know, stop him from being able to study his master's degree. Audhu Billah. But Allah exposed him in the end. That's what we have to be careful of. When you try to expose your brothers in haram, Allah will expose you, subhanAllah. Stay away from the van. SubhanAllah, another story I told the brothers earlier today about one of the famous scholars. He made some tweets on, on, on his Twitter account that even made me dislike him. I used to have a lot of love for him. I used to admire him. He made some, some political tweets that I didn't like. And I said, how could he say something like that? I said, if you have nothing good to say as a believer, don't say anything, right? This is the sunnah. If you have nothing positive to say, don't say anything, right? How could you... Say what you said politically. How could you praise someone politically who doesn't deserve to be praised? So a couple of months later, even though I didn't say anything, I kept it myself. I didn't say anything. I didn't get on the member and talk about it. SubhanAllah. A couple of months later, 
I was sitting with one of the brothers who knows him personally, and he said, Alhamdulillah, he sent us news and told us what happened. Because he didn't just say bad things, he said bad things about another country altogether. A country who used to take good care of him and, and treat him like a VIP. But when his country differed with that country, the Twitter went against the other country. I was like, this shaykh, you have no shame. They said, Alhamdulillah, he sent us an apology through some different sources that he was arrested for two days. And his country, they threatened him until he opened up his account. And they're the ones who sent out about five tweets in his name, ridiculing the other country. It wasn't him. There's nothing he could do about it. Huh? So this is always said, someone who is good, have positive bun, positive thoughts about them. Because you don't know the reality. Once we learn, says Tafullah Miskin, we falsely accused him or falsely thought something negative about him. And he was, he could have been tortured. We don't know. They could have said, look, we're going to kill you. Some of these, these countries say, we're going to do this to your wife. And they'll do it. We're going to do this to your family. So, he, he, so always have positive thoughts. So he, so there's something maybe we don't see behind the doors, what's happening. And it's because it's not the nature of this individual who is someone who is positive and someone who is good. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbids us of what? The third thing, which is backbiting. وَلَا يَغْتَ بَعْضُكُمْ بَعْضًا and do not backbite your brothers and sisters. What is backbiting, Ya Khan? The Prophet ﷺ gave the definition of it. What is it? Dhikruka akhaq bima yakra. To say about your brother that which he dislikes. He has a certain characteristic. You know he's a bit overweight. He's got a big belly and he doesn't like it. And you say, oh, the guy with the big belly? The fat brother? Huh? Here, this is something, what? You're backbiting. You're saying negative things about them behind their back. You're talking about them behind their back. And you know, if they were to know that you talked about them behind their back, they wouldn't like it. This is considered what? Ghiba and backbiting. Anything that you know that they wouldn't like you to say behind their back and you're saying it, this is backbiting. But it's something that, in actuality, it's true. It's a characteristic that they actually have. Perhaps, and you're, it maybe it's your opinion in some cases, or, or it could be true. But what if it's not true what you're saying about it? This is the buhtan. Even worse. You're saying something about him behind his back that he would dislike, and it's not even true with that, subhanAllah. So this is what we need to stay away from these things, Ya Khwan, as having the bad thoughts, the suspicions, assumptions of our brothers and sisters. Stay away from spying upon them, and stay away from... Uh, Backbiting. And look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ended the ayah. Would one of you like to eat the flesh of his brother when he's dead? How many would like, you know? Your brother's dead, let's just go cut off some pieces and put it on the grill. Anybody down for it? It's disgusting. This is it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a harsh example. But that shows you the reality of backbiting. It shows you the reality of these sins. You would, you, 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 you would dislike it. You would hate it. You wouldn't take it. So like this, stay away from in this life. Stay away from saying anything negative. SubhanAllah. If we know the reality, Akhwan, of the ayub or the faults we have in ourselves, we're not, we can't focus on these other things. There's no way we can go make tajassus and look for the faults of others when we know our own faults. There's no way we can go and talk negatively about other people behind their backs when we know all the negative things that we have. There's no way that we can have suspicions when we know that people could have suspicions about us as well. We wouldn't want our brothers to have bad suspicions about us, so we're not going to have bad suspicions about them. We know if we made a mistake or we did something that looked a bit dodgy, we'd want our brothers to th think good about us. SubhanAllah. And like we said earlier, when we do this, when we implement these teachings, we're going to solve so many problems right from the beginning. I remember I was in Sudan, and I visited some of the scholars there. And you'll find that many groups and many scholars, they always like break down into different groups. They differ, they differ, and they start to break, they get into smaller groups. But they were very strong when they were together. But these particular sheikhs or particular brothers, they're always together, never, they never break down into, into different groups. They've been together for years like this. They never had problems. I asked one of them one day, I said, what is the secret? What are you guys doing? Because other groups, they always fall into, you know, different like subgroups and main groups and 
two and three groups out of one group. What made you guys stick together? And he said, we differ. We have differences. Don't think we don't. We fall into problems. We do. It's normal. But he said, we made a commitment to one another long ago that if anything arises, anything comes up, anything that we hear, that we go to each other immediately. It could be sometimes from one of your trustworthy students who misunderstood what the other sheikh said. And then he hears, ah, oh, so that's, that's the way he's going now. All right. I got you. I know who you are. Sends you what's up. Says, Shh. I'm not going to answer him now. And now he's like, why is he not answering me? What's going on? Then uh, the shaitan comes. And then on the member. And then on Facebook, sending out shoo, shoo, huh? the heavy artillery against, against one another. But right away, what did they do? They come together and they say, I heard this about you, Yaqi. This is the way of the believer. Explain to me. I heard you said this. What do you mean by this? He said, Yaqi, well, I said this. And what I meant was this. And he said, oh, subhanAllah, the way it came to me. And always don't forget, brothers and sisters, when news spreads, have you, whoever here has played the, the Chinese whisper uh, game before? How, and who's played? Nobody's played it before? So what happens if we were to do it now, and I tell him something, Imam Bukhari was a hafiz, for example. Imam Bukhari was a hafiz of the hadith. He would come back and tell me, vanilla ice cream is gross. This, this is how it ends up in the end. It completely changes as it comes around. And, and it always happens like that. You know, how did someone hear that? It seemed. Someone heard it, heard it wrong. Someone understood it wrong. Someone explained it in the way that, that they understood it. So always you have to make sure. Always. Have, and where does it start, Yaqwan? It starts with our Iman. And there's many other lessons from this surah. We'll end with one of them, inshallah. Because I don't want to take too much time make it too long. I came late. And that's, I think, why I was speaking a bit fast as well. Because I was we were 20 minutes late. We'll blame that on the driver. <laughs> but inshallah, perhaps he has a good excuse, inshallah, for being late, inshallah. And maybe it wasn't him. Maybe it was the one who was being driven. Who was the reason why they were late. Or maybe it's the food that the driver fed us. We don't know. Anyways, <laughs> there could be a lot of reasons. And perhaps they're all good and valid, inshallah ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned who the true believers are. When he said, innamal mu'minuna. That only believers are those who, and then he gives some of their characteristics. <laughs> those who believe in Allah and His Messenger. There's no doubt about it. And the Sahaba, عنهم, when they reached the levels they reached, because they reached the level of yaqeen, of certainty. When they said that the Jannah is there before Uhud on the battlefield, in the Shahada fi Sabilillah, what did the Sahaba say? Bakhin, bakhin, khalas. So the Jannah is there. The, the dates he was about to eat, he, he, he threw them down and went straight to Jannah. Bismillah. Because he has yaqeen that once I go there and I, and I am blessed with the shahada, then inshallah I'm going to Jannah. Wasn't doubt. Well, maybe I will go to Jannah. Let someone else go first. And then if, then if I have to go, nah, there's yaqeen. Thumma lam yartabu. There's no doubt. And when you reach that level of strong iman, that makes you reach, reach the level of the strong yaqeen. And with those two, you, you reach the highest levels of the deen, with the iman and yaqeen. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَجَاهِدُوا بِأَمْوَالِهِمْ وَأَنفُسِهِمْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ And they strive with their properties and their own lives in the cause of Allah. They do everything for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They live for Allah. They're, they're, their main service is the Muslim. SubhanAllah. And the beauty of Islam, Islam doesn't forbid us from enjoying life. Islam doesn't, we talked about this in, yesterday in, 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 the, in the conference. Uh, with Sheikh Bilal and, and Sheikh Tariq. That was the topic we had about deen over dunya and how you can actually have both of them. You can, in Islam, you can have the best of both worlds. Alhamdulillah. You can enjoy life. You can have fun. You can have a nice car. You can have a nice house. Uh, all of these things are allowed for us in Islam. Alhamdulillah. But at the same time, you strive for your religion. Imagine if all of us were to put religion number one, where we would reach as, as individuals, because when you put religion number one, you get the assistance of who? Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah assists you, khalas, everything else is taken care of. Even if something bad happens, you have strong iman, it doesn't affect you. You know how to deal with it. You don't break down. Why? Why is this happening? That's the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah. That perhaps you dislike something that's good for you. Alhamdulillah, I know. Perhaps it's a good thing that I'm happening. It's all good, alhamdulillah, at the end. The Prophet he said, he said, how wonderful is the affair of the believer. It's all good for him. 
If something good happens, if something bad happens to him, he's patient. And if something good happens to him, he has sugar. He makes sugar. He's, he's, he's thankful for it, alhamdulillah. This is only for the believer. It's the only, the only for the believer, as the Prophet ﷺ said. So once we reach this level of Iman with Allah and His Messenger, and we reach this level of Lam Yartabu, we have no doubt, no Yaqeen, and we strive for Allah with ourselves and our money, fi sabirillah, and the cause of Allah to support our Ummah, to support the establishment of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, what's going to happen in the end? Allah said about these individuals, Ula'ika humus sadiqun, that these are the ones who are the truthful, the ones who have the true Iman are the ones who stay away from these things mentioned in the Surah, who refrain from these things that are mentioned in the Surah, and those who strive for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for the religion of Allah. And I'll end just with the last verse, something very interesting. The last verse in this Surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Inna Allah ya'lamu ghayba samawati wal awd, wallahu basirun bima ta'maloon. Pay attention to the meaning of this verse. That indeed Allah knows the unseen aspects of the heavens and the earth. And Allah is all seeing with that what you do. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala end this surah with all of the lessons we've taken about Iman and what is true Iman and the characteristics that we need to stay away from, which we described today as the social obligations that we need to have as Muslims. All of these things we need to stay away from. All these things we should be doing, all the things we shouldn't be doing as believers. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after all of these lessons, why did he end the surah with this ayah? It's not because it sounds good at the end. It might sound good, it might sound nice when you read it, right? But there's reason behind this hikmah. Allah is the alim, the hakim, as he said in the surah as well. The all-knowing, the all-wise. Why did he end with this surah, with this, with, this, with this ayah? First of all, what is it saying? That he knows the ghayb, the unseen aspects of the heavens and the earth. Everything Allah knows. And Allah is basirun. He's all seeing with that which you're doing. Nothing escapes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what is the wisdom? To show us and remind us that all of these things, all of these things that are mentioned here in the, in the surah, that we're supposed to stay away from them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows if we're doing it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows if it's in our hearts. And that's why if you go back to the surah, to one of the ayahs as well, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, who is the best amongst us? And there's an important lesson we should mention it actually at the end here. From the ayat in, in the surah. Who is the best among, uh, amongst us? In akramakum عند الله يتقاكم. This is one of the key principles of Islam that's mentioned here in this. Allah told us, Ya ayyuhal nas, inna ja'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'ila lita'arafu. Allah told us that he made us, what? Tribes. Tribes and different nations. Why? To get to know one another. And subhanAllah, there's one of the benefits actually of being in a society like in Malaysia, here in KL, we have multiculturals, multicultural society from both the Malaysians themselves and from those who come to visit and those who come to live here. Some people don't like it and some people this, but there's so much benefit that you can gain from other cultures. And there's a hadith, it's not authentic when it comes to the chain of narration, but as the scholar said, the meaning of it is correct. And that is the saying, Al-Hikmatu Balatul Mu'min, that the wisdom is the lost belongings of the believers, of the believer. Wherever he finds it, he takes it. So if I come to Malaysia and I find the, 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 the Malays, they have a, a good custom, something I didn't know about, I'm going to take it and I'm going to implement it in myself. If I go across the sea to Indonesia, I say, well, that's, that's cool, that's nice, I'm going to learn that. If I go to Nigeria and I find something, I say, well, that's pretty, I, that's interesting, I didn't know about that, I'm going to take it. Huh? <coughs> Anywhere you go, you find something good, you benefit from it. And this is one of the benefits of having different cultures and coming together. But who is the best out of all of these people all of the creation, Allah made it clear. Inna akramakum Allahi atqaqum. That indeed the best of you in the, in, the, in, the, in the sight of Allah is the one who has the most piety, who's the most pious, who has the most taqwa. This is the best. It's not which tribe you're from, which nationality you have, which passport you have. My passport, I can go into 180 countries without visa. Yeah? So yeah, well, the Europeans, they have to get a visa to enter my country, but I don't need a visa to enter theirs, you know? 
So this, so this subhanAllah, what, it, it doesn't mean anything. What really means something is how pious you are. Allah made it clear in the Quran. It doesn't matter where you're from, who your family member. I'm the son of so and so. It doesn't matter if you don't have piety yourself. My father was pious, but you're not, and it's not going to benefit you. Pay attention. But look at the end of the ayah. This will remind me of this verse, actually. What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say at the end of this ayah? Inna Allah alimun khabir. Inna Allah alimun khabir. Allah, He's the alim, the all knowing. And the khabir, all acquainted with all that you do. Yani, the alim, He's knowing with all of your actions towards others. Pay attention, ya khwan. How you treat other people, Allah knows about it. And also equate it what's in your heart towards others as well. You look down upon people in your heart because they're from such and such a nationality. They're from such and such a background. Because my nationality is better than theirs. My, pa my passport is, even it might be in the, in, in, in the reality. But who made him from that nationality made you from this nationality? Once again, as we mentioned earlier. لا تسخر لا يسخر قوم don't, people don't ridicule make fun of other people. You don't know your country can fall. You can have a financial crisis. And then all of a sudden you'll find from 100 plus countries you were entered without a visa, now you enter 33. Just like the one you were making fun of one day. Be careful. إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ يَتْقَاكُمْ These principles, wallahi, if we were to focus on them, and we can't give just to this surah, so we just get a bit from here and there some of the benefits that we can gain. We need to reflect on the surah time and time again. Come together. One, for example, we're having a sitting. We're coming together one night here for tea. Uh, and um, Malaysians, do you guys drink a lot of tea? I don't think you guys do, huh? I don't know. You do drink a lot of tea? That's right. So, oh, yeah, you have the, okay, I remember that. I, I haven't been here for like a year and a half, that's why. Huh? And now I've been here with non-Malaysians, that's why I don't know. Huh? So, inshallah, tonight we'll get some tea, inshallah. Bismillah. Huh? Uh, actually, the, the brothers I've been with, they've been doing the American way to me. They bring me coffee the whole time, mashallah, so I forgot about the, the Malaysian customs. Bismillah. At the end of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds that meaning again, that Allah knows all of the unseen. Allah knows what is in our hearts. Allah knows with what we do. To remind us, and this is the greatest reminder, this is the reality of taqwa. We want to put these things into action. We don't want to look down upon anybody. We don't want to backbite. We don't want to spy on our brothers. We don't want to have suspicion and dhun about our brothers. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what we do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what's in our heart. We need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, if you look at the verse before that, and it don't, you know, uh, to come into any, to, 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 to think you're doing something for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you enter into Islam. Allah Rather, is the, he's the one who gave you the favor that he guided you to the iman. And kuntum sadiqin, if you truly believe believers, then you have to put these things into action. Please. So many lessons and so many benefits that we gain from this story and from this, this surah. And if we were to focus on these meanings, like we said, we would definitely fulfill our social obligations. Allah knows best. Allah alam wa sallam wa Muhammad. And you have to forgive me, I went a bit longer than I planned on going, but alhamdulillah, perhaps inshallah there was benefit in it. If there's anything beneficial, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If there's any mistakes, it's from myself and a shaitan. Allah knows best. Allah alam wa sallam wa sallam wa baraka alam Muhammad wa jazakum Allahu khairan. Is there any, uh, are we having questions or?
then Masama Salam stood up when there was a procession of a, a Jewish um, funeral, like a you know, Janazah. So uh, on the basis of opening the door for Dawa and on the basis of preventing, whereas the one that under. So how, how do we understand this? Um, yeah, if, if there is a fatwa that's been issued by one of the muftis here, uh, as a guest, I prefer not to get into it so it doesn't become into a, a political situation, first of all. Uh, secondly, alhamdulillah, I've talked about this in detail uh, last year in several video clips in detail about what's permissible and what's not, and what is the ijma of the scholars when it comes to this issue. I talked about it and we, we uploaded it onto my YouTube channel. So if you type in my name, uh, Abdurrahim McCarthy, and you go to the playlist, you'll see that it's there. I think it's uh, like five or six videos. I don't remember. We, we filmed it in London with the brothers there. Uh, so it was a bunch of questions. We, we, we put into different videos, some of them four or five minutes, eight minutes, some of them. So you can see that, inshallah ta'ala, and you'll, you'll get the answer in detail there, inshallah ta'ala. Any more questions? Brothers, sisters? Take your chance because it's not always here. Everybody, everybody, well aware, right? Complete. He has mentioned a lot from the surah. Okay. Come, salam to the brother. From the beginning of the lecture, I'm saying that we should not maybe think, not maybe we should not think other than uh, the Sunnah and maybe the Quran and the Sunnah. You understand? So after that, do we need question? Do you need to ask questions? No, he said we should think out of the, the Quran and the Sunnah. We shouldn't think out of the Quran and Sunnah, yeah. yeah. It means that as a Muslim, our life should be the Quran and the Sunnah. Yes. Then, I mean, after this statement, do we need culture? Do we need what? Culture. 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 Um, the, I mean, certain things from culture that don't go against the Quran and Sunnah, there's no, there's no problem with that. Because what I mean is that everything is in the Quran and everything is in the Sunnah. But for a culture, this is something that people can't go with. I mean, people make it. You understand what I'm saying? So, yeah, but, but I'm saying here, Ani, cultural things. Every different country around the world, even at the time of the Prophet Sallam, and in different places in the Arabian Peninsula itself, people had different cultures or different customs. That's something that's normal. And Islam doesn't forbid us from having these things or from acting upon them. But if it contradicts or goes against Islam, this is what's forbidden for us. So, and, and what we need to do as Muslims is that and we can have certain cultures. You know, if I'm from Africa somewhere, or if I'm from Egypt, or if I'm from Malaysia, wherever it is I'm from, that we have certain cultures. If it doesn't go against the Quran and Sunnah, then no problem, alhamdulillah. And in Egypt, they eat mish. Huh? Maybe in Malaysia, they don't eat mish. It's not, alhamdulillah, it's, it's halal. Huh? It's, it's cheese, it's, it's old cheese though. So I don't know, maybe for us it's makru, huh? For the, for the Egyptians, huh? Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> it is, it's a custom, and no, nothing wrong with it. And he, for example, they sit in a certain style of sitting in, in their houses. Their house is made in a certain decoration. These are, these are from customs. It's, it's no problem. But when it goes against, and this is one of the main problems that we have from Muslims, that we put our culture in front of our faith. We say, well, this is, it's true, Islam says it's haram, but our culture says this. And we do it in the Muslim countries, and then the Muslims who come to the West, they, they drive us crazy. They put us through hell and back. Why? Because we have 50 different cultures. All of them, it's like a cultural Islam. There's like, so there's like 50 different Islams coming in our masjid now because this is what we do in our country. Bismillah. So we have it from the Sunnah like this. Let's act upon this. So these certain things which are, are cultures that don't go against just regular customs, no problem with that. But when it goes against the teachings of the Quran, so this is where we stop. And how do we stop like this? We have to start implementing. Once you start to implement things and you start to practice certain Sunnahs, then it starts to spread. But if everybody is too shy to practice them, then the, the haq will never, never be known. People won't act, won't act upon it. And you'll, you'll be surprised how, how quickly things can change. Just if a certain group of people stand up, one person, then a second person, a third person, and then what, it starts to spread after that. It starts, it starts to spread, the khair starts to spread, and that's what we need 
uh, is to be all of us to be role models, to be positive as Muslims, uh, to spread the khair in Shalom Ta'ala. Any more questions? Oh, can I have the mic? Yeah. Uh, our brothers still have questions, but he asked us others to ask. Um, yesterday, inter interestingly, I was uh, at, a, at a lunch invitation at a house here. So, so he, he didn't come to the conference yesterday, huh? <laughs> I was there. I, was there. I attended the lunch and got back to the No, I'm, I'm joking, I'm joking. So right? this, go, this goes back to Hussein al -Bun. Good done. Yeah. So why wasn't at the conference, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, so at the end when we were departing, um, one of the guests, not the host, uh, went around asking the brothers if they could make a dua for the, for the host. For, uh, for the host. So um, he approached me, and I told him, I don't know of any such dua that we have to officially make for the, for the host. Mm. But apparently it sounded like it was a culture here in Malaysia, probably when you, when you visit the house uh, for the first time or if it's a new house. So uh, I told him that we have to take, you know, it's a part of Ibadah. Anything to do with Ibadah, we have to take it back to the Quran and the Sunnah. And, uh, I tried to explain to him, but apparently he was like kind of insisting it's okay, but then just make a dua. And I literally had to sneak out of that one actually. So I would like to know if there is anything like that. Is this a Malaysian thing? Will you make, uh, maybe the Malaysians can explain to us. Yeah, sounds quite common. What, what, what is the dua that happens? What is this? Uh, What's meant by it? The dua can be, uh, can be just anything they created or anything from the uh, <laughs> the, the one uh, they combine with the tahrir, you know, for the oh. dua and everything. So it's either just the dua, which can be done by anybody who's uh, knowledgeable, or uh, a dua that already have in a book saying that oh, this is a tahrir kind of thing. Mm. Um, from the sunnah, obviously, there is sunnah, there, there's a dua that's made for the host, when he, especially if he fed you. But then there's dua, you know, several duas that you make that are confirmed in the sunnah. And this is what we should stick with. Uh, if you made a general dua for him, you know, that's also something that's good. But to make it like you have to do it, this could become an issue then. Like, you know, like you can't leave until you make the dua like that thing. Or it's, a, or it's the really looked down upon type thing. This could be an issue, obviously. But if it's just something, you know, uh, a general dua that someone makes for him, then that's, that's, that, that wouldn't be an issue. But if it's like a specific, like she said, there's something that's not from the Quran and sunnah, so du'a or group du'a, this, you might want to stay, obviously stay away from this. This, this, this could be an issue. But when, the, the du'a that you make for someone he gives you, uh, he feeds you, the, the, there's two different... Uh, 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 you know, uh, the, 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 Allah feared the one... No, no, أَفْطَرَنَكُمْ الصَّائِمُ وَأَكَلَتْ طَعْمُكُمْ الْأَبْرَاءُ وَصَرَتْ عَلَيْكُمْ مَلَائِكَ This is one of the sunnahs. And um, uh, what's the other one? Uh, Subhanallah. If we, I think if you feed me, I'll, I'll come to me. You know, certain du'as, they only come after the day. <laughs> it's like the du'a of istiftah. You try to say without say Allah, you, you forget about yeah, it. Yeah. Huh? Uh, what's, what's the du'a? What's the other one? Um, he said this one, yeah. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair. After I eat, inshallah. I will have the tea and then I'll say the du'a, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Another question from the same uh, uh, you said, 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 you said, you said, you said, you you said, you you said, you and here, if a, we're not allowed to spy upon our brothers, but in the other verse, we're commanded to investigate. So, tabayyinu, investigate. This is different here. Because here you, you, you had news that's come to you that something in the, perhaps that concerns you or concerns the ummah. And so here, you're going to investigate to see what's true or not. Okay, um, this individual did something that harmed you, harmed your family. 
uh, do something to, to society, something you need to know that, that's true. Um, he came and he said that uh, your brother uh, Muawiyah, he said this about you or this about you. So this now I need to investigate to see why he's talking about me. To see if it's true or not. And then, and then that, that's what we have to see. But if they say, for example, Brother Zaid goes to the nightclub. He prays on the front row with us. He's in the masjid. He reads Quran. He, he attends the halaqa that we have. See, he goes to the nightclub. He no, I'm going to find out. So we're going to go tonight to the nightclub. We're going to film. We're going to follow him. Okay? And then this is, this, this is, not, this is what you spy. This you don't need to know. It's between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's something you, you shouldn't want to know about your brother's sins and his faults. Okay? Then we're going to put it on Facebook tomorrow, on YouTube. We're going to expose him. Astaghfirullahaladzim. Huh? So this, now this is what we're not supposed This is what means don't spy on them. But if some news comes to you, he yeah, said this about you, he said this, brother did that, then we, need, then, we, then we need to know. And this happens a lot. You know, and especially in the world we live in, we know around the world, and you hear some, one of your brothers did this, and then you take something in your heart against him, you don't make sure. And then when you hear his side of the story two years later, uh, he, says, he, he was right and the person who told you was wrong. And for two years you've had something in your heart against your brother because of this. That's what's meant by the, the, first, ver the first verse, which is, which means to confirm, to investigate. And the other one about spying is just trying to look for his faults when it doesn't concern you. That's the difference. Last question. Let's see when we, we have something on our to say or something when we saw something not right. When we won't utter it. So is it what is it considered like if we're if we're not the back body, we're saying something in our heart. Does it count? Like would the angels write it so? Inshallah, it won't count. If you, if you don't utter it, you don't act upon it, if it's in your heart, you're not going to be held against it. But once again, if you see something that, there's two things. Like you, you see something that's, that's not right, disliking that is from Iman. If someone's committing a sin, for example, this is, you're supposed to dislike that in your heart. At least, at least that's the minimum, as we said in the beginning. However, if you see something, a fault that someone has, like for example, the way someone looks or some of this, and you don't like it, you didn't like what the, uh, the, 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 the sister had on, you didn't like you know, the way uh, such and such had their hair or something like that. You keep it in your heart, you know. Like, uh, but if it's not, you, you don't go anywhere and, and talk about it behind their back. That's the key thing. But if you have it in your heart, you don't like it. And that, and that could be sometimes normal. There are certain things that maybe people would wear or people would do. How could you, how could you dress like that? How could you do that? It doesn't make sense. But okay, if you don't say anything about it, it's in your heart, it's in your, it's in your heart then you won't be held accountable for that in Shalom Tana. But it's always good to, you know, to try to keep your heart clean you know, from everything. So you know, once st things start to build up in your heart, then it can, it can lead to that which is more dangerous after that. So we have to be careful. And obviously it doesn't lead us to what making fun of them or ridiculing or looking down upon them. Uh, this is also another key thing. Um, Sheikh, is, is one sinful for not talking against a sin disease? Like a monkar? I mean, the, the, it wouldn't be sinful as long as you hate it in your heart. The brother's asking... We would be sinful if we don't uh, talk against the sin. But if you have the ability to do so, and you're someone of authority, then maybe you'll be sinful. Then maybe you'll be sinful. Uh, if it's in your house, the munkir, and you don't say anything about it, you don't do it, then yes, you're sinful. Because you're responsible. Kulukum ra'in wa kulukum All of you, he has responsibilities. He's responsible for that which is beneath him. Now, even like, for example, your children, when they get older, it's your job to advise them. You see that, and you'll be sinful if you don't, even though they don't live under your roof, your roof anymore. But when they become older, you, you might not be able to force them to do it. But when they're younger, you can, <laughs> alhamdulillah. <laughs> even the older, sometimes you can give them, as my son will tell you, I give him, if he needs it, you know, alhamdulillah. We'll rough him up a bit, alhamdulillah. He's almost bigger than me now, but alhamdulillah, I can still, you know, <laughs> give him a few, alhamdulillah, huh? <laughs> if needed. Inshallah, he doesn't need it, but inshallah. Huh? So this is the, this is the, inshallah, the, uh, the ruling, inshallah. But one of the reasons, weakness we have in the ummah is none of us talk anymore. Munkah just flies by and it's like no big deal. This is the problem. Uh, based on the same, 
The, the, that, the, but it's an obligation, we're talking about generally speaking. I mean, everyone has to do it. But someone has to do it. If no one's doing it, all of us become sinful. This is another important point because it can fall under the fartifai as an ummah. As an ummah, it becomes fartifai. Someone, someone has to be doing it. But if no one's giving da'wah, no one's doing it, then all of us then become sinful. This is true, yes. So we, and we have to make sure that we fulfill our obligation of calling that which is good, forbidding that which is evil. And, and each one does it in the way he can. Not everyone has the platform or the ability to speak out. Some people, if you speak out about certain things, it's going to harm you. You're going to not be able to speak anymore. So it may be the hikmat, or you say it in a different way. So this is, you always have to look into the, each situation is different. But as a whole, as an ummah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it very clear. And Allah said at the end of the verse, uh, that there should be an ummah, a group from amongst you, who make da'wah, who, call, who call, give da'wah, and they call to that which is good, and they forbid that which is evil. And Allah said at the end of the verse, that these are the muflihun, these are the ones who are the successful ones. We'll never be successful as an ummah until we focus on these things. Can I have a question? Yeah, bismillah. Okay. But in, uh, okay, then what's Islam is ruling from espionage? Are you doing no, as, as, a, as, a, as, as a government, uh, no, 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 on the government level, that's different. That's different, and it's something governments have to do in order to ensure the safety of their country. If any, any, and even the Prophet وسلم, mentioned that the Al-Harb Khuda' in a it's 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 uh, what's the exact translation of Khuda? It's not coming to me. But the the point is is that any you do certain things at the time of war or warfare have different rulings basically. So the the point is is that uh, as a government, this is something governments need to do, you know, and to make sure that the country stays safe, to make sure they keep tabs on things. So this is actually a very important part of this. Even the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did it himself alayhi salatu wasallam. He had different people he would send to gather information. And we see uh, at the time of um, the, uh, the, one of the things that saved the Muslims in the Battle of Al-Khandaq was the fact that when this man became Muslim, one of the first things he did was to go and to get news and to spread something between the Jews and something between the, the Mushrikeen. So he got the Mushrikeen to go back and got the Jews to go back on what they said. So this is a part of espionage, is it not? So this is something that, and he, if it's done in, in a halal fashion, not harming people, obviously, and not getting into affairs you shouldn't get into, but the same rulings come into things, for example, if it's, if it's something personal, it's something their personal life, it has nothing to do with the safety of the country, then this becomes haram. But if they do it for that which is the safety of the country, this, this is something that any, any Muslim government must do, and no, no, no doubt about that. And they, they do it anyway, so alhamdulillah. <laughs> as long as they do it in a, in a halal fashion, then that's, uh, that's good, inshallah. Uh, I'm, I'm referring to the most recent thing, Huawei and our thing that they have with the rest of the Canada, where the people, I mean, the government of America is back, and Huawei is doing it. I don't know anything about this. Yeah. Is this with the lady who was arrested or something like that? Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I heard, I heard it recently, I don't know, I don't, I guess I don't watch the news that much, you know? So. This is the character of this person, and this one he do, is that a bad thing? It depends why you're saying it. There's certain, there's certain things where you have to make it clear to people. There's other times where you shouldn't say it. You see what I'm saying? If, there, if there's no benefit behind it, okay? Let, let's say, um, the brother, what, what's your name, Akhi? Amin. Huh? Amin. Amin. Okay, I, I'm just, I just met Amin. I don't really know him. And you come to me and start to tell me some negative things about his characteristics. It doesn't benefit. Why, why would you tell me? This becomes backbiting. But if Amin comes and wants to marry my daughter, he comes, he says, Mashallah, I want to marry. And this now, you come and say, Look, he's a good brother, but this and this and this. Now you have to tell me. It becomes fault upon you to tell me. Especially if I come and ask you. Say, Look, and he, or, or for example, let's say if you're doing business with Zaid. Huh? Our brother Zaid here, we're doing business with him. And he's a good brother, but when it comes to business, 
He's got a bit of monkey business, huh? <laughs> huh? So if you if somebody come to you say, you 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 worked with Zaid before. How is he when it comes to business? Say he'll pay you back. You know, maybe about eventually, eventually <laughs> at, at, about ten years down the line, maybe. But eventually, they'll pay you back. You know. But if he told you one year, just add, add about nine to it, and, you, and you'll get your money back, inshallah. So this is this is something you need to tell tell the people here. But if, for example, if if, if Zaid didn't pay back Amin his money for the next five years, and we're having dinner tonight, and you tell yeah, Zaid, you know Zaid. Hopefully, none of you is named Zaid, by the way. Huh? It's like uh, Zaid and Amr. This is an Arabic uh, Nahu thing. Always Zaid and Amr. They always give the example, huh? Yeah. So now, if Zaid, you, you, we're having dinner. We're having this 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 delicious Malaysian tea, mashallah. And what's it called again? Tetare. 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 Yeah, I remember. Yeah, go like this. So now I remember. I see. I had forgotten. Subhanallah. If we're having this tetari, we're sitting, we're having a nest, and then you say, you know, that Zayd didn't pay uh, Amin for, for five years. He didn't pay him back. There's something bad about him. This is backbiting now because it has nothing to do with me. I'm not going to give Zayd any money. I don't have any money to give him in the first place. So, alhamdulillah. <laughs> so, this is, this, is, this is the difference now. But if, it, if it's certain things where you need to tell someone or you need to warn someone or someone comes to you with an advice, then that's different, inshallah. As Imam Noah mentioned, six different. Any ways that make it halal to, to, to mention or to backbite about someone in law is best. Uh, Alhamdulillah, I suppose that's okay. If you have more question needed, perhaps a personal, a personally come to share and ask. In the meantime, should be okay here? Yeah? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Alhamdulillah, for tonight, mashallah, something that actually in front of us, we already know, but here it highlighted again to us.